Welcome to the webinar, Understanding Business Interruption Claims and Coverage for COVID-19. This is a recording of a webinar which was originally broadcast on April 23rd. I would like to thank the law firm of Resnick and Lewis for hosting this webinar. Next slide. This webinar will be presented by myself, Russ Nassoff, and Elizabeth Martini. We're going to first start talking about the epidemiology of COVID-19. And with discussing the epidemiology, we're first going to clarify the terms SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. When we talk about SARS-CoV-2, we're talking about the virus itself. And when we talk about COVID-19, we're talking about the disease or coronavirus. While there are many potentially scary things about COVID-19, one of the biggest is its transmissibility, which seems to get more and more potentially transmissible every time we hear something new about this disease. First, it was the asymptomatic carriers causing infection, then it was airborne contamination, then it was social distancing, whether six feet was enough, whether masking was enough, and as we learned more, it never seems like we're doing enough to prevent the transmissibility. We do know that while the primary route is airborne droplets, such as coughing or sneezing, there are secondary routes of exposure through the touching of contaminated surfaces, as well as contaminated air. And we also know that the virus is present in feces, meaning that the oral fecal route, much like when we talk about disease such as norovirus, can be another source of potential contamination, although probably less likely. While it's hoped that, that the transmissibility will actually decrease when temperatures turn warmer, this is not yet clear, with mixed evidence from the Southern Hemisphere, as well as from countries with tropical climates. Next slide. We do know that to prevent transmission, we need to wash our hands with soap and water for 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer with at least 60% ethanol if hands are not visibly dirty. We also know to cover our nose and mouth when sneezing or coughing and to keep our distance, although new studies out of Asia are now saying that even six feet may not be enough. We need to stop touching our face. We need to stay home if we're sick and we need to use EPA products approved to disinfect surfaces that have been contaminated with SARS-CoV-2. Although as an enveloped virus, the good news is, is that this virus is relatively easy to kill. There are also many new passive technologies out there, such as dry hydrogen peroxide, low energy plasma, and others that are also effective against coronavirus, while at the same time working round the clock and will not be harmful to any occupants. Next slide. There's probably no issue uh, about coronavirus that has closed more businesses than the virus's transmissibility. For owners, the closing of a business is going to trigger a multitude of questions, but for certain questions will be asked as to whether this will trigger business interruption clauses of insurance policies. Historically, business interruption coverage will be triggered when there is a physical loss or damage, but what this actually means varies from state to state with some states requiring demonstrable and physical alteration to property, such as like when we talk about a fire or a flood, while others say that the damage may be unnoticeable to the naked eye, provided it makes the building uninhabitable and unusable. I like to think of examples such as asbestos that fall into this category. Just because asbestos is present in a building doesn't mean the building is uninhabitable unless the asbestos becomes damaged and the asbestos fibers are present in the air, even though they typically won't be visible. Next slide. So SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus, which means the genetic RNA of the virus is contained within a protein capsule or envelope. All viruses want to create more virus, and the way they do that is by injecting this RNA into other host cells. And unfortunately, those host cells are you and me. But if you make the virus disappear, the RNA can't do anything and it starts to degrade. Therefore, just finding some coronavirus RNA after the envelope is gone doesn't mean that you still have a viable or infectious threat. I like to think of it similarly to finding discarded bullet shells on the floor. Just because you find them doesn't mean that you've got an active shooter, only that at some point in time in the past, a gun was fired. Next slide. 
So when we all read about finding coronavirus RNA in the Diamond Princess 17 days after the last passengers had left the ship, what did this really mean? And what was the significance of this finding? And why did everybody get so excited about this? Next slide. But we need to remember that just because RNA remnants are present doesn't mean that the virus is still infectious or viable. It just means that the virus is still detectable as it was on the Diamond Princess. Next slide. So just this month, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study evaluating the viability of SARS-CoV-2 on a variety of surfaces. And as you can see, the virus lasted longest on plastics, but actually started to degrade after just a few hours. And after 72 hours, it was no longer viable. And if you look at the other surfaces, stainless steel, cardboard, copper, its viability time was even shorter. Next slide. Shortly after that, The Lancet came out with a study which seems to indicate slightly longer viability times. This study showing up to seven days on plastic and stainless steel and up to four days on glass and paper money. So a little bit longer than the prior New England study, but still relatively short. We do know that SARS-CoV-2 is stable at colder temperatures for a long time, but doesn't do so well in hot temperatures, which is why they're thinking or hope that the virus may fade when warmer weather arrives this summer. Next slide. So just because a virus is detectable on a surface doesn't mean that touching the surface is going to lead to infection unless the virus is actually an intact genome. Finding bits and pieces of RNA like they did on the Diamond Princess doesn't mean that it was necessarily capable of transmitting disease. And the longer the time period since the, virus, since the virus was deposed on the surface, the greater the likelihood that it's degraded to the point where it's probably no longer infectious. Remember too that the Lancet and the New England studies both were done in a protected environmental laboratory. Conditions in a real life environment are a lot harsher and therefore we would expect that the viability times would even be less than those shown in the studies. Next slide. So when we look at the science of SARS-CoV-2 viability and compare it to the law, the question becomes whether a property can still be considered impacted by coronavirus if only bits and pieces of RNA remain and it's no longer viable. And does this presence of a non-viable virus render a property uninhabitable or unusable? So the legal question then becomes, can a business shut down for weeks or months and claim business interruption for weeks and months if SARS-CoV-2 is only viable for at most a few days? Next slide. Well, courts have held that even if the source is not visible to the naked eye, as would be the case with this virus, in order for there to be physical damage, that source must be demonstrably present and must render the property unusable. So the issue becomes, is this the case if only bits and pieces of the coronavirus RNA remain on a property? Surface in a building and determine if SARS-CoV-2 is present or not. However, we still can't determine viability. All we can tell is if the viral RNA is present or absent, which as we now know is not necessarily indicative of infectiousness. In addition, your results are obviously only as good as the surface that you happen to swab because these are swab samples. So if you miss an area, you may actually get a false negative. However, I still think this testing is going to be very helpful to confirm whether the virus is present or absent, especially in high touch areas. And I think it's going to generate some level of protection against potential liability prior to recovery or, or work continuing or your business reopening. Uh, it should be noted that this type of testing is what we call RT-PCR, which is real-time PCR testing. Uh, you may have seen some people advertising for ATP testing. ATP testing is not specific for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's really more bacterial than viral testing. Next slide. So in addition to testing, it's very important, Elizabeth had alluded to this, that companies have a pandemic risk plan developed. 
Uh, insurers are going to require this, I think, in the future. And we've discussed this with our clients for years, starting with the SARS and the MERS outbreaks and with Ebola, but never was there an urgency like there is now. And if you develop a plan, it should include identification of a risk team, performing a risk assessment that's specific to your industry and specifically uh, the risk that's involved to your industry, response actions that are going to be taken in the event that someone does get sick, uh, control measures, both general and specific, which we're going to go over in a minute, to your facility to prevent and respond to issues. And it should also uh, address issues to be aware of if you decide to actually close. As Elizabeth mentioned, there are going to be issues that happen even if you close up your business and leave and then come back uh, when things get better. And so we're going to look at some of those things as well. Next slide. So talking about a risk team, the risk team should be a multidisciplinary group usually consisting of risk management, security, corporate management, facilities engineering, custodial and housekeeping, legal, public relations, and then you may want to also have some pre-qualified third-party consultants, contractors, and experts. Um, and these, all of these people, uh, you should designate detailed responsibilities and reporting requirements, and they should be included in your pandemic plan. Next slide. After the team is identified, that's when you're going to want to do your risk assessment. And the goal of a risk assessment is to evaluate how much risk you actually have and where that risk is located. For COVID-19, you're certainly going to want to evaluate your risk based upon the degree of close contact that's required with those who may be infected or asymptomatic, especially if your business requires interaction with those outside of your own staff. It's also important to keep up with any federal or local regulations as they're going to dictate limitations on what you can and can't do, and even whether you can stay open or not. If you can remain open, you must consider if you're even able to social distance or whether you're gonna to need to have staff work from home and how or if you can function, given that you're probably gonna have increased absenteeism. If you do have staff work from home, you need to provide them with resources so that they can perform functions remotely. And for those who aren't teleworking, so those who are still working in, in your office location, resources such as personal protective equipment, enhanced hygiene at work, training and education and competency on COVID-19 issues has got to be provided. You should develop questionnaires uh, designed to elicit pertinent information on infection for staff and guests. And you should also make sure that you've got backup supply chain sources uh, prior to any outbreak, especially if you're gonna remain open. Next slide. With respect to a staff illness program, these have gotta be developed and updated regularly based upon new developments. Sick employees should be encouraged to stay home. Any employee should self-isolate for COVID-19 for at least 14 days. If they've been tested for SARS-CoV-2 and they're waiting for results, if they've been exposed and they have symptoms, if they have symptoms even without known exposure, or if they're caring for someone with COVID-19, or if they've recently been to an area with a high incidence of disease. So a lot of opportunities and reasons to self-isolate. And they shouldn't return until they're symptom-free and have, two, have, have had two negative COVID-19 tests 24 hours apart. For those staff who are still working, Self-health checks should be performed, and they should also be performed for those prior to returning to work. And for anyone who gets sick at work, those folks should be immediately isolated, given a face mask, and transported home if possible. So you don't want them on site. Next slide. In addition to isolating the employee who gets sick at work, the affected area should also be isolated. It should be contained and negatively pressurized if possible. You want to shut down or isolate the HVAC system to the affected area and increase air circulation to other areas. And you don't want to clean the impacted area for at least 24 hours because remember, this virus can be carried and is often carried in droplets. So you want to give time for those droplets to settle. All public areas should also receive enhanced cleaning and disinfection using products approved for COVID-19. The EPA has what they call a list N. I'll go into that in a minute. That covers all the products that are approved for cleaning uh, and disinfection around this virus. 
All response actions taken should be documented, including the time, the location, who is involved, the procedures, the outcomes, and you also want to document your compliance with your plan and add some photographs as well if you can. Next slide. In addition, as Elizabeth mentioned, there are a lot of legal requirements with respect to employer and owner responsibilities for invitees, guests, and staff on site, including laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act, Family Medical Leave Act, the OSHA General Duty Clause, whistleblower protection, and general landlord owner premises liability, which you also need to be sure you're complying with. So a lot of intersection with a lot of possible legal uh, requirements. Next slide. We're now gonna look at some general control measures. For businesses that opt to remain open, if you're allowed to remain open during the pandemic, facilities should increase their hygiene, such as adding hand sanitizing dispensers, adding disposable wipes and letting your employees have them, uh, adding even things like tissues, no touch disposable receptacles, adding posters to remind people about hygiene, especially at key areas of the facility. Also, as I mentioned earlier, instituting social distancing in public areas, making it easy for people to comply. A lot of places are putting tape markings on the floors to indicate where people should stand. Eliminating seating is a big one. Ending certainly communal food and buffets. Uh, conferences are gone, as we all know. Um, and of course, many jurisdictions have gatherings limited to 10, 50, or 100 people, whatever is the requirement you're in your particular geographic location, you should be sure to comply with. With respect to payments, you should pro try and promote tap and pay to limit handling of things like credit cards and cash. Uh, if you do need to handle these things, you should supply gloves to the staff who must interact with guests for payment. Um, covering things like pay registers and plastic, covering computers in plastic so that they can be easily cleaned. And you can even consider uh, thermal temperature imaging of staff and guests as they did here in Las Vegas at the Wynn Hotel just prior to closing, they were actually scanning everyone who walked in the door. And as I mentioned earlier, there are technologies in a, um, that are available now that actually continuously clean the environment and are effective against SARS-CoV-2 so that you're not only as effective as your last deep cleaning, these systems work continuously so that if anyone enters the site, the virus is pretty instantaneously deactivated. Next slide. In addition, with respect to personal protective equipment, employers need to provide workers with this if you're going to keep working. All staff involved with cleanup and disinfection uh, has, have got to be trained and fit and competent to use PPE, including things like taking off and putting on gowns hand hygiene, gloving, and appropriate use of, of those EPA-approved disinfection products. They should also be required to report any breaches in personal protective equipment or breaches in the risk management pandemic program. We've all heard that N95 respirators should really be uh, just limited to healthcare staff, but N95s could be required if staff are working within six feet of a potentially infected person. But if you're going to give an employee an N95, you gotta be sure that they've been fit tested and trained. They've gotta have medical certification to wear this respirator. And you also need a respiratory protection plan uh, for your site. Next slide. Fortunately, as I mentioned before, this SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus. It's relatively easy to kill. And generally, regular household disinfectants are going to work to kill this virus. But the problem right now is finding products that are on that EPA list N. That's the list for products with emerging viral pathogens and human coronavirus claims that are effective against SARS-CoV-2. There are other products available that will kill coronavirus, but they're not on the list. And many companies are actually using those since it's virtually impossible to find many of the products on the list. But the EPA has made an exception and they do say that there may be additional disinfectants that meet the criteria for SARS-CoV-2. You just have to check with the manufacturer. And what we're telling our, our clients is if your product isn't on the list, check to make sure that the components are substantially similar to those on the list. So you're gonna look for elements, uh, components such as quaternary ammonias, hyperchloric 
hyperchlorous acid, products that contain those things should be just as effective as any product on that list end. But be sure that whatever product you're using, that it's not used beyond its expiration date and that you're complying with any contact times with surfaces that are required. Laundering is an acceptable way to clean uh, products or goods or, uh, that have been impacted by this virus. Uh, cleaning in hot water and dishwashing also very effective and good for killing this virus. Next slide. COVID-19 waste, so things that you're going to throw out, it is not hazardous, at least that's the latest that we've heard, and it can be disposed of as municipal waste, although it's got to be wrapped in plastic and sealed. The waste handlers, however, should wear personal protective equipment, face and eye protection and gloves, but they don't need to wear respiratory protection. Next slide. When we look at some specific control measures, we're going to start first with some non-essential uh, food service establishments. So food service establishments that are not essential should put in place enhanced hygiene, just like we talked about, providing things like wipes and hand sanitizers to both staff as well as customers. Health inquiries of staff should be made prior to each shift with respect uh, to any suspect ill personnel that you find, they should be sent home. And facilities should actually consider closing if they do have a confirmed case of COVID-19, especially among their staff. Deep clean should be performed daily with ongoing enhanced cleaning of all high touch surfaces. If you can, customers limited should be limited to drive-throughs and they should be made to call upon arrival if food is being delivered to the cars, if, which is what it should be. Food should be delivered with appropriate packaging, preferably on trays so you can avoid touching uh, even even the transfer of touching of, of packaging from one person to another. If car delivery or drive through is not possible, then customers have to come into your facility, but they should be limited to entry areas only, and ventilation should be increased to all occupied areas of the facility. Next slide. As with other facilities, commercial office buildings also need to increase hand washing, post hygiene etiquette reminders, should certainly shut down things like communal food and beverage uh, beverages, including things like coffee, uh, should be discontinued. Staff should be discouraged from sharing any work-related items, even things like pens and, paper and pencils, staplers, calculators, computer mice, compu uh, communal hard touch surfaces should be cleaned and disinfected nightly. Careful attention should be paid to things like elevators, railings, entry and exit doors, fax and copy machines, countertops, hand sanitizer and disinfectant should be provided to all staff so that they can use them where and when they need to use those things. Social distancing in the office should be encouraged and if possible, you should stop all invitees and guests from coming in. And if it isn't possible, you should strictly limit their access to drive ups, or to limited areas of the facility. Uh, staff should be educated about disinfecting and cleaning protocols, product use, and any personal protective equipment re required. Next slide. If public restrooms can't be closed, then they should at least be deep cleaned every 24 hours using disposable cleaning cloths and mop heads. You don't wanna mix any clean and dirty items or, or use the same item to clean a clean area as you do a dirty area. So you want to use separate cloths for cleaning and disinfection. Restroom doors are notorious sources of contamination. They should be given extra attention and cleaned often. Drinking fountains should be shut down if you need to offer bottled water. With respect to lobby areas, gatherings should be limited in lobby areas. Outside visitors should be prohibited if possible. Visitors should be directed to certain entry, exits, elevators, stairways, and there should be enhanced cleaning of all lobby high-touch surfaces. Lobby security staff should wear gloves and masks, and ventilation should also be increased in lobby areas. Next slide. Gyms and health clubs, most of them have been closed, but if they're still open, equipment should be cleaned and sanitized after every use. Again, you want to add hand hygiene stations. All communal food, water, headphones should be discontinued if they're not individually wrapped. With respect to swimming pools, you need to verify the chlorination levels daily. 
disinfect all water features uh, as per manufacturer's recommendations. Things like pool furniture and cabanas should be cleaned and disinfected after each use. If this in, is impossible, then at least nightly. And any utensils, cups, cutlery should be disposable. You shouldn't use anything that needs to be cleaned and all attendants should be wearing gloves. And certainly you don't wanna commingle any clean and dirty towels. Next slide. For hotels, might be possible to actually deny entry to a guest who presents with symptoms of COVID-19 on check-in, since those symptoms might present or health risk to others. If you're unsure if a guest is sick, but you're suspicious, you can isolate the guest to a designated area until a determination can be made. If the guest is already checked in, they should be advised to self-isolate, seek medical help, offered things like room service and access to a hotel physician. If a guest is sick with, night, with COVID-19, you should also notify the local health department and other guests should be notified prior to check-in and given the option to leave. Current guests that are healthy should also be notified, given recommended precaution and shouldn't be check, uh, penalized if they decide to check out early. Next slide. With respect to cleaning guest rooms, or any items that can be reused in a hotel guest room should be removed and substituted with disposable items if possible. If it's not possible, then use those disposable covers so that these, these items can be cleaned and they should be changed after each room turnover. High touch surfaces, you wanna clean and disinfect those also on each room turnover. And again, staff should be using separate cloths for cleaning and for disinfecting and cloths should be disposed of there for cleaning each room. Next slide. But now very briefly, we're going to talk about what happens when businesses close and what the risks are. Elizabeth had alluded to this. So, so should a business decide to close, it's still important that regular building inspections be performed to ensure that there are no things like water intrusion issues. Elizabeth mentioned both water intrusion issues and mold. Uh, it's important to keep ambient building conditions such as temperature and relative humidity maintained within acceptable parameters. Risk management should be notified immediately if there are any plumbing or landscape related issues or any evidence of water damage or mold along with any musty odors or elevated relative humidity which could be indicative of water intrusion issue. Next slide. Climate control systems shouldn't be shut down. They should be kept working. Buildings should have work, uh, working backup generators and power sources in the event of outages during periods of shutdown. Things like sump pumps and other critical equipment have got to be maintained. And companies should have people on site even during times of shutdown. So you want to have a skeleton crew on hand to ensure that building systems continue to properly function. Or if it's not possible, then be sure that you've got alarms and sensors in place which can generate alerts to uh, notify appropriate parties if and when these systems are failing to operate within acceptable limits. Next slide. Another issue to be aware of are building water systems and water stagnation. Things like Legionella and growth of other waterborne pathogens. There may be state and local regulations that must be complied with and most commercial buildings should now have water management plans in place that are in compliance with ASHRAE 188. 188. Growth of pathogens will be facilitated during periods of non-use due to potential growth of things like biofilms, inadequate hot water temperatures and water chemistry like chlorination that are out of acceptable limits. Those are gonna lead to proliferation of bacteria. To prevent these issues, all distal sites or faucets should be flushed a minimum of five to 10 minutes, at least every five to seven days when the building is unoccupied. And outside vendors or building staff have got to monitor the water chemistry and make adjustments as needed. Next slide. Water features such as fountains, whirlpools, pools should be drained and disinfected if not in use. And if cooling towers are present, they should be maintained to, pre to prevent growth of bacteria as well. When you come back and you start up your building water systems again, after a long period of shutdown, that can also create pathogen problems. And an evaluation should be made if you need to treat the water systems, such as uh, by performing things like a hyperchlorination prior to startup to prevent the dislodgement of all those biofilms. 
to the extent that you have any secondary disinfection systems on a site, they should be maintained or ensure that if you've got a third party vendor that they've got remote monitoring and are remaining and are maintaining those systems. Next slide. In closing, when you're ready to reopen and return to work, there are precautions that must be taken, including and most importantly, verifying the health of all staff members. And you can ask for test results from those impacted by coronavirus, as long as the results are kept confidential. The entire site should undergo a deep cleaning, utilizing products that are effective against SARS-CoV-2 if continuous disinfection systems are not in place. Items that are dishwasher or laundry safe should be cleaned in the, that manner. Air circulation should be increased in the week prior to opening. And consideration should be given, as I mentioned before, to flushing and or hyperchlorination of the water systems. Testing should be performed to verify water chemistry parameters, things like hot water temperature and chlorination, and any water damaged or mold impacted building materials should be removed and replaced. Now, also, as I mentioned, testing of high touch surfaces can be performed to verify the presence or absence of SARS-CoV-2 using that real-time PCR testing. And those lab results should be maintained in the event of future allegations. Next slide. So to sum up, SARS-CoV-2, highly transmissible virus, which will remain viable on surfaces up to seven, several days, but we now know that it degrades and becomes non-infectious over time. How this will affect business interruption claims is not yet clear, nor is the entire issue of business interruption claims in light of COVID-19. But to minimize damage and risks, insureds must develop pandemic risk management programs, which include things like risk assessment, risk teams to establish best practices to minimize risk and make determinations whether to remain open if permitted or whether you should close. Facilities that stay open have got to address a variety of issues, including occupant illness, and we must develop things like general and specific control measures to protect staff and visitors. Facilities that close are also going to have problems. They must be aware of both water intrusion issues, which can lead to things like mold, and maintaining building water systems to prevent bacterial growth. And then upon reopening, verification of both occupant and building health is important to ensure that buildings are safe for reoccupancy.